smoking. Hello, Christopher. Hey, Nick. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Uh, personally, I think um, the windfall tax, it's, it's short-termism created by politicians who, on both parties, in all honesty, who have really made a bit of a mess in our energy policy over the last 20 years. What I prefer to see are taxes being cut in our energy bills and also at the fuel pumps. I could really honestly do with a cut in VAT and also in the green levies. So the, so the, the cut that you want is to be paid by the people through less tax going to the government, not from the companies who are profiting from this, uh, uh, this unearned hike in their income. Yeah, personally, I would rather see consumers get a um, get a relief, really, when they pay for their energy and also when they pay for their petrol and diesel. It would really make an enormous difference for me in uh, seeing more more free spending for me. Right. So, really... so less tax from that less tax uh, put on these products by the government. Correct. Yeah. Right. So, so uh, which. Uh, of the schemes that the government uh, uses taxpayers' money to fund, would you want cut? Uh, so, let's see, on energy bills, so no VAT on No, no, there. no, no. It, okay, so there's no energy bill. So the government would be getting less taxation, so they would have to cut, what, the NHS spending, the police? What, what would you have? I think the government would would see increased revenues because people would have uh, more disposable incomes to go spend and save. But, but <laughs> that, that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. So they'd stop collecting tax on fuel and they'd start collecting tax on whatever it might be. Uh, I don't know. Cars. But that would be the same amount. You'd just be taking it from uh, from one product and putting it on another. Oh, raising taxes is, um, it deters economic activity and at a time when economic growth is really slow, now is the time to be cutting taxes and uh, to keep growth going because it's, it's stagnant in all honesty and it would really see a huge benefit for me and I'm really squeezed middle, I've just bought my own house and I can honestly do with some extra money just to keep things going. Right, uh, that's uh, one of those I'm alright Jack calls. Thanks, Christopher. Forest Hill. Hello, Hugh. Hello there. Hugh. Morning. Um, yeah, I've been an NHS patient for years now, uh, and I've always found the dentists I've gone to reasonable, even when I paid some charges and when I didn't pay charges. But I'm, I'm not got many teeth left now because I'm 78. Right. But the point is, one of the dentists said to me, your teeth are very soft because... Your mother didn't get enough calcium in the war. You must have been in a war, baby. I said, yeah, I was. I said, I grew up with rationing. Mm. But that's by and by. But I visited several dentists, and one of them peeled all my teeth. One of them did Every what? Every flipping tooth he did... peeled. Oh, Phil. He was an Australian dentist, and he took the top right off of back molar. Yeah. Big tooth. And I went to another dentist a couple of years later, and the top had come off this wretched thing. Mm. He said, oh, blimey, he said, there's not much I can do with that. He said, it's going to have to come out. He said, there's a big one, I'm going to have to pull you about a bit. <laughs> so I said, well, do, you, do your best or your worst or whatever you can do. Yeah. And he got hold of it. It was down below the gum, so he had to go into the gum with the tongs or what they use, pullers, mm. and uh, he bow and he said, I'm going to go left, I'm going to go right take the strain, don't let me dislocate the jaw. I said, no, try not to. I'll have trouble talking to you. So, uh, anyway, he got it out, and it was a double double root one, big thing, just the lower part of the tooth. Yes. And it didn't give me any trouble at all. I mean, it bled a bit. Um, I wasn't diabetic then, and I went home and had a slap-up meal. But the thing is, <laughs> I've always found dentist to be very good. One dentist gave me a root canal, a lady dentist from the Baltic, and she um, did, she said, look, I've got to do this without anaesthetic. Are you up for it? Without said, anaesthetic? Without anaesthetic. I Why said, is yes. that? Because I got a heart, had a heart condition oh, okay. at the time, and also I hadn't eaten a heavy breakfast, which she wanted me to have had. So anyway, she, did, she, 
she is, is there are there more gruesome details to follow? No, 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 no. She just did it very gently. She said, I'm going to file it away manually and with a drill and perfect job. Right, OK. In short, <laughs> um, you've, uh, you've been able to find an NHS dentist, or rather, you were on one's list already. You have been on somebody's list for a long time. Uh, that might be, uh, you know, a, that that might be a different experience to those who are trying to get on an NHS list to begin with. Uh, thanks for that. A little bit too much information, but, but I appreciate the call. Walton in Surrey. Hello, Gerard. Hello there. Hello there. Hello. Um, Hello. Yeah, I've had a caller Hello. earlier talking about... <laughs> what was that? I don't know. <laughs> are, you well, are you hearing you're, you're, things? Uh, I don't, I don't know. Uh, you had a caller earlier talk about um, Keir Starmer and his sort of port parties. Uh, I can tell you from experience that port is quite the hangover. And uh, yeah. hangovers are kind of quite different as they used to be. Well, it depends on how much you drink, of course, but it is like cough syrup. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. And uh, how much have you had so far this evening? He just hung up on himself. <laughs> uh, I'm on like about three or four pints of port a day now, man, but I can handle it. I just can't operate this phone at the moment, that's all. Crawley, hello, Graham. Hiya, how are you doing? All right, thanks. An ecstasy of fumbling. Yes. What do you reckon uh, of Diane Abbott being the Prime Minister? Um, no, no, no. Oh, come on, it's got to be better than Bodger, isn't it? Oh, uh, well, that wasn't the initial question. Ah, but I've just added, added something oh, to the question. Oh, right, you've, uh, uh, you, uh, you've, you reckon, you, uh? you've uh, made an addendum. Uh, yeah, correct. <laughs> it's a no, and furthermore... No, 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 no. No. Why not? Let me say it again. No. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think she'd be good. Angela Rayner. Uh, no, come on, Diane Abbott. No, Angela Rayner. Give her a chance. I mean, put her on probation for a year to see how she does. <laughs> Give her a chance? Well, why not? Why not? Well, let, let's just, uh, you know, to hell with it. It's only a country, isn't it? No, I, I think Angela Rayner. No, Diane Abbott. Angela Rayner is the uh, person of the moment. Hmm, I don't know. Darren Abbott made a good comment today, so if Starmer, Starmer goes, hmm. Boris goes, there could be a, a chance for us again. Yeah, no, I, I seriously doubt it. She does excellent work right where she is. I, I would imagine that she doesn't want to <laughs> uh, progress another mo another foot. <laughs> OK, uh, well, yeah, right, true. OK, maybe. Another satisfied customer. <laughs> St John's Wood, Jonty. Oh, hi, Nick. How are you? Good, thanks. Um, I'm not normally a militarist, and I wouldn't normally go over 2%, but I think we're in extremely unusual times right now, and I think we really need, as a nation, to wake up to the threat that we have here. Um, the first thing I'd like to bring to your attention is that there is a systemic asymmetric war going on here in the sense that the Russians, I've done quite a lot of study on the military weapons available to NATO and the Russians. We're about three decades ahead of the Russians. They're fighting with tanks. They've got some ships. We've got extremely agile field weapons that are helping the Ukrainians with the British and American training to knock out these Russian tanks and inflict massive casualties. We have a $40 trillion economy against their $2 trillion economy, which is declining. And Biden has just committed to $32 billion of spending purely on arms for the Ukrainians. So Putin's facing a situation where he cannot win this war. He can't show a win conventionally. So then if you look at Putin, this is a man who is now ideologically committed to the subjugation of Ukraine. He's morally capable of mass destruction. We know that already from his track record. And we know he cannot afford to lose. So therefore, if you play the logic out, he has no choice. Your, your, your interviewee was absolutely right. He has no choice, if you take all those assumptions as correct, 
other than to use what are called tactical nuclear weapons, which makes, I hate that term, it sounds like, you know, collateral damage. It makes something awful sound palatable. The definition of these nuclear weapons is a yield of one kiloton to 10, uh, to 10 kilotons. And when you put that into perspective, Hiroshima was 15 kilotons. So these, this is still a, a weapon. These are weapons that can cause 50, 100,000 deaths. So therefore, once what he's calculating, I think, is that the West don't have a logical response to him once he's dropped a so-called tactical nuclear weapon because we don't have an option that does not risk massive strategic escalation. So he's got every incentive to drop a tactical nuclear weapon. So either we have to spend more and actually, because he always underestimates our resolve, either we have to spend more to go in harder in the current uh, uh, battlefield, or we do what we do in 1945 when we let Poland and the whole of Eastern Europe go to the, the Soviets, we leave Ukraine to Russia, but then we have to arm massively in NATO and deter any future aggression. So whichever way you look at it, we have to spend, and we have to spend big. Yeah, well, I think that you've, you've outlined the problem with that argument, though. All that Vladimir Putin has to do to win in Ukraine is to drop a nuclear weapon <laughs> anywhere in that country, and the, the resolve, the morale of the Ukrainians would uh, drop through the floor, and he would win straight away. They would be uh, crawling, no, crawling to no, him. No, I don't and, agree with that. Well, no, 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 no. It seems hard no. to uh, believe that that's not the case. What, why would that not be the case? No, the Ukrainians, I've been, to, I've been to Ukraine. I know a lot of Ukrainians. These guys are extremely resolved. They're the kind of people that would say, having gone through what they've gone through already, the men of Ukraine right now are the kind of people that say, we prefer to die than to be slaves to the Russians. Well, that's, that, that's them. Think. Yes, but that's them personally. They, they they don't want their families to die, and they don't want the obliteration of their entire country. So, if he did just drop one on Ukraine on uh, right. Kiev, for so instance, then the whole of the rest of the country uh, would um, be petrified that he would do the same to them. So, that it, it seems impossible to believe that they wouldn't surrender immediately. All right. Let's assume they are. The, the logic of my argument was either way you have to spend big. If they surrender, or if we don't supply them the arms, both are possible, could be either or, or both, in which case they get defeated, they're subjugated. We have to arm NATO massively to deter the Russians but, from going but, any yes, further, but, but your, they will but, go again. But your other argument was that we aren't, um, we don't have, have any response to him dropping a nuclear weapon because we're not insane. I mean, what would we do? No, we, no, Nick, Nick, we, Nick, no, we, no, no, we, no, 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 Well, hang on a minute. W would we um, drop a nuclear weapon on Moscow if he dropped a nuclear weapon on Kiev? Of course we wouldn't, because because we're not mad, and he knows that, so he can pretty much get away with anything Nick, that he likes. Nick, yes. Nick, you're arguing with Nick. You're arguing with yourself. No, you're, argue, you're arguing. You're no, arguing no, with yourself. Answer, listen to my answer. What I said is if we surrender Ukraine to Russia, so we retreat from the battlefield, there's no more Ukrainian war. The Russians subjugate Ukraine. They do whatever they do in Ukraine. That would be the new status quo. The logical response to that is even more spending on our side to arm NATO sufficiently to deter Russia. Yeah, but it, John T, it, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make any further. difference because if he starts with a nuclear weapon, we would not respond with one because we're not insane. That's the problem with this mutually assured destruction story is that it only works if both sides are sane. Let's take this three-dimensional call uh, in Oxford from Oliver. Oliver. Hi Nick, how are you doing? Good, thanks. Um, I just wanted to tell you what I thought was a, uh, a mind-boggling little fact. Okay. Um, so, clearly, all the words we have for objects are thought up by people and therefore someone's mind. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore the mind thought up all these words. The mind thought up all of these words. I'm so, with, I'm with you so far, taking baby steps. Good. Go ahead. Good. And therefore, the brain... Yeah. Named itself. <gasps> wow. The yep. brain named itself. Yowza. This is the sound of my mind being blown. <laughs> I am sitting here stunned. Good. Well, I, I thought you'd like it, so um, I'm pleased you have. Okay. <laughs> excellent, <laughs> excellent work, that man. <laughs> Glasgow, Eric. Hello, good evening, Nick. Eric. Good evening. Sorry, am I allowed to mention who I'm voting for? Say that again? Am I allowed to mention who I'm going to vote for? Uh, not really. 
No, that's fine, that's fine. Well, I've decided to, who I'm going to vote for, but I won't say who I'm going to vote for. But the reason uh, I've allocated um, who I'm going to vote for is that I'm an ex-British Army soldier. And the party that I'm going to vote for uh, helps veterans more than any other party. Um, and under the current climate, Nick, um, you know, uh, they're having to help people like myself. Right. Um, you can say and, and, you can you can mention the party, just not the actual person involved. Oh, sorry. So, it's, well, I'm voting. I'm going to vote Tory party. Right. And I'll tell you why. Uh, the, the Ben Wallace, for example, um, who I believe is Prime Minister, material and negotiating material, and a total gentleman. Um, they, they kind of people help me. I got a war pension. It's not a lot of money. It's, it's certainly not a lot of money. But I'm very grateful that I get it. I served in Iraq. Um, and I don't, I don't believe that um, any other party are up to, up to, uh, up to, up to doing this. Right. So it's not, it's not a, way. it's not a local issue that's uh, made your mind up. It's a national one. It's about the part, well, the national party. It, yeah, where, where I live is is also uh, an area um, of 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 a, of a Tory area, and I'm, I'm a working class background. Very most expert service personnel are Nick. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an ex uh, British Army soldier. I was a private and a lance corporal. But I'm emphasising on the fact that there's no really un uh, other other party that's that's going to that's going to help people like myself. And or, or that the, there's uh, actually sort of made uh, p public comments about what they might do. You mean? Exactly. Yeah. Made public comments. So we we may do. Right. I would just like to let the, the, the nation know that. Uh, let's have a call in Camden. Hello, Claire. Hi, Nick. Take your time, Claire. I am um, the... <laughs> Sorry. Um, the the nice man on stilts oh? told us that there are the nice man on stilts. The nice man on stilts, right. The... the the, the smug, nice oh, man the, 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 right, okay, the, uh, the ghostly hat... The ghostly hat stand. I don't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> he told us that there are really big benefits from Brexit. Mm. None of which we could mention but, at the moment, uh, off the top the of his head. The thing... <laughs> is there a delay at your end, Claire? It's, it's, it's like... The thing is, are you on the International Space Station? Or in no. a submarine. <laughs> um, <laughs> go, go ahead. Um, a, a, sub, a submarine might be useful. A because, sub, yes, that's right, because um, we're all going he, down. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the thing is that this big uh, lump of golden benefits yeah. are somewhere on the sea floor of the the ocean of time the sea floor of the so ocean of time Ruby. wow you've blown my mind <laughs> so we have two uh, options yeah option one either we drain out yeah Either we drain out <laughs> the ocean of time. Yeah, draining out the ocean of time. There wasn't an album by Yes. Draining out the ocean of time. Uh, I don't. Yeah. Very, very good one. Go ahead. O or we just sit down and wait for time to, to drain itself, to finish. Uh, that uh, the, the second option. Does it and involve... Then we'll and then we'll see. Does it involve not doing anything? And then we'll be able to very easily go to this big shiny lump of, of benefits. The big shiny and lump of benefits. it will be really big and really shiny. Yeah, very really big and shiny. It'll be absolutely yeah. ma massive. Like a cow. Nobody will have ever seen such a big, lump, <laughs> a big shiny lump. Yeah, but yeah. We'll, we will <laughs> very easily be able to see it because because we'll be able to walk on the on the, on the surface floor of under the, moon. the ocean of yeah. time. Right. Wow. 
That, that makes a lot of sense, Sir Claire. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate every single syllable. I didn't understand any, any of it, but I appreciate all of it. Thank you. Archway, Robert. Yeah, hello, Nick. How nice to talk to you. I, I love your impish humour. Thanks, Robert. <laughs> uh, you're going to get the Monday from hell if you have a four-day week. Uh, it's been very noticeable over the last ten years or so that uh, I always make sure I'm ready for Monday morning and you know, clear the desk on Sunday, clear any last-minute things. Hmm. And increasingly now, I find during Monday, the work is coming in faster than you can clear it down. And you finish Monday with a backlog, and you then spend the rest of the week catching up to get back in control sort of by Thursday. And then lots of people are knocking off early again. So it, it really is, uh, you know, the Friday off, I'm sure, is very nice for some people, but it... it they need to watch out. Careful what you wish for, because Monday morning could be really awful. I guess the even if you take Friday off, your email account doesn't, and they'll still keep piling in. Oh, yes. Yeah, and the text messages and the WhatsApp and the Teams chat and the Yammer, uh, or a most unfortunate name for company chat forums, I think, but... Uh, uh, all of these things, of course, carry on almost 24 hours a day, especially if you work for a, an international company. And so, you know, three days off is is v impossible for many people anyway. So you end up doing bits and pieces. And if you're not careful, you may well find you end up working most of Friday anyway. But it, it has been very noticeable how work has, has been sort of shifted away. You know, Friday afternoon goes very quiet these days, and then Monday is is always manic but i del i deliberately try and keep the number of teams calls and things like that down on a monday because i know there's going to be lots of unexpected people say oh i meant to do this last week but but you know i forgot and uh, you know could you get it done today um <laughs> i wonder if it's worth it though to work later say monday to thursday not cl clocking off at five or six but you know working through to seven or eight just with that in mind that you that you can just take Friday and do nothing. Yeah, I suppose. Well, if everybody does it, maybe, maybe it'll work. But I, I, I suspect that some people will end up being the sort of cushion for it. And it, you, you were talking about home benefits, home working. I've worked from home since 1996, had a dedicated office at home. And, and this worked really nicely. And then we had lockdown and everybody else was working at home and I found it it really screwed up the, the serenity because, you know, I'd, I'd go in to, to my main clients once or twice a week and the rest of the time I'd be working from home. Um, but, you know, there were always members of the team there at the office to keep eyes and ears open and attend to any last minute things. But when everybody was at home, the atmosphere I found changed and... Uh, one of the, it's a bit like um, bowling out eight skittles and having one skittle, one on the left and one on the right. Uh, you know, right. if you work with the states, you get, you may have calls. If you work with China, you may have calls first thing in the morning, sort of eight or nine o'clock. And if you're working, particularly if you're working with Silicon Valley, they don't come in till four o'clock our time. So you may end up with calls scheduled for sort of eight thirty and 5.30, <laughs> and then a big gap in the, in, in, in the middle. So, so some of these new working methods, I think, are going to take some working out, and I have a funny suspicion that at the end of the day, we'll all end up working rather harder. Uh, well, it seems to have gone that way so far with all of these uh, time-saving devices. We, uh, we, we appear to have less time. Thanks, Robert. Liverpool, Vincent. How are you, Nick? Are you OK? Yeah, good, thanks. I just listened to that fella. As it, you, when you phone up for a dentist appointment, you should just get it, shouldn't you? Oh, uh, well, I guess they're limited by the amount of uh, time they've got in the day. But no, when you phone up, you just get an appointment, don't you? You can, you can say what you want about anything, but that's what you should do. Just get it at the end of the day. And you phone up and you say, I want an appointment. If he says I'm busy, they're busy, aren't they? But we can make so much out of dentists, can't we? Uh, well, what's your experience? Well, my experience, well, the last time I went to dentists, he said, uh, your teeth look all right. I said, I have not my mouth yet. No, I, no, he said, but at the end of the day, you just phone up, 
for the dentist. It's not hard work, is it? If you don't get an appointment, you don't get an appointment. Well, uh, that doesn't really seem to, seem to solve the problem, but that is undeniable. If you don't get an appointment, you don't get an appointment. I can't pick a hole in that, Vincent. West Molesy. Danny. Hello, Alan. Who? Nick. <laughs> yes, David. Yeah, my apologies. Who's Alan? Sorry, that was Nick. I, I thought I was speaking to uh, Alan Capitco. Right, I don't know who that is. That was my follow-up point, actually. What's your first point? The first point was, you know, I think the, the recent resignation of Alan Capitco in the Elmbridge constituency, you know, I think it speaks volumes of what's going on in the, uh, in, the in the southeast, particularly at the moment. Yeah, volumes. I've got no idea what he's talking about. Tufnell Park. Hello, Kate. An ecstasy of fumbling. Yes, Kate. Kate will be with us momentarily when she realises there's a 10 second delay. Oh, too late. Farnborough. Hello, Andy. Hello, uh, Nick. Andy. Um, what people seem to be losing the thread of is it's a local election, not a national election. I will be voting. I'll be voting to keep my local council in. They are conservative. The streets are clean. The lights are on. Your bins get emptied. The parks are clean. The car parks are good. It's not about who paid thousands of pounds where you sat through lockdown um, to keep it going and who wanted it to continue. It's not who had a beer in London, who had a beer in Durham. It's not going to change the price of oil, petrol, gas, electric, price of milk. It's not going to affect the cost of living. It's local. If you're happy with where you are local, the way things are going on, keep it the same. So that's what I'm going to be doing. Is that always the way you vote in local elections? Yes. Yes. If I'm happy with how it is, I will keep it how it is. Um, I mean, it was a time years ago when around here it was a Liberal council. Um, they ran a very good council, but we didn't seem to trust them with government. Um, so you've got to vote what's best for you locally. You know, it's not about national. Um, it's not going to change the balance of power. If that's what people are thinking, they're decidedly wrong. Um, and they need to realise that. You know, I can understand people are frustrated with the way things are going on, but that's not going to affect where you live. This is going to. One example... Uh, London, for example, Kensington, um, Neighbours Camden. One is a council run by the Conservatives, the next is a Labour council. The Conservative council is £500 cheaper on council tax. Um, that works for me. You know, you've got to do what works for you um, locally. If you're happy with how it is, that's the way it should be. Streatham. Hello, Robbie. Well, good evening. How are you? Nick? Good, thanks. Yeah, I'm pretty good as well, actually. No, I didn't ask. Nice today. But I'm glad anyway, to hear it. I was going to say, politicians, the only good politicians are dead ones. Well, but I knew as you were going to say the, that. Quite alarming, actually. But I was going to say that, uh, in fact, actually, we've missed the St. Valentine's Day massacre. I normally say we should put them all up against the wall. And right, OK, it. that's a, a very aggressive person. <laughs> Take his number, call the police, dial 99, and then hover your finger over the last nine, just to be sure. Blimey. A little bit alarming. Little bit alarming. Just, just a smidge. I'm alarmed. Um, but I, I do expect that it's, it's all your fault, Boris Johnson. All your fault. Explain yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where, 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 where do we? You've mean? upset that bloke. He did seem like the type who would be uh, easily upset. <laughs> you know, like he would start an argument about two raindrops falling down a window. Forest Hill. Hello, Hugh. Hello, Nick. Hugh. Yeah, um, yeah, you're still talking about trains and southeast surveys. Sure, why not? Um, I was on a train once going down to see my eldest son. He lived in West Malling. And you have to get a train from Bromley South. And uh, I needed a toilet because I'm diabetic. And there wasn't a single toilet on the train open or unlocked. Nobody in them. Only engaged. They were locked yeah. externally. Locked for your convenience. <laughs> or inconvenience. So anyway, when we get the other end, I have to cross the footbridge from the down platform and the other side, and you have to go through the 
go through the uh, ladies' waiting room to get to the toilets. Now, so, so wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. The ladies' waiting room. The ladies' waiting room. When, when, we, when did you need the loo? In the 1960s? Since, exactly. when, since when has there been a ladies' waiting room? Well, it was. This, this bum was more ladies' waiting room. Okay. They never took the old sign down, I don't think. Right. But anyway, I missed it, because I, I was going out through the exit, mm. and I ended up peeing in the edge outside. And, um... That's quite some mess. Well, exactly. I mean, it's, it's terrible, really. And they should have brought the, the signs up to date. So when up the survey date. came... Yeah. I filled the survey in, I think I gave them naught minus out of everything. Right. What a system. Another dissatisfied customer. You could say that. Right. But the trains in general are pretty good. That's what I say that. And it was on time. Yeah. Well, they're okay. Um, yeah, I mean... The they're, they're better now they haven't got ma ma many people in them. Let's put it like that. There weren't many people, no. Yeah. Many Almost people completely not. uninfested with people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The fares down there are quite expensive, but I had an old people's ticket that was um, yeah, too, too blooming reduced. much. Right. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot, Hugh. That was uh, Hugh taking us to the loo. Hastings, hello, Mark. Good morning, Mick. Mark. How are you doing? Great, mate. Uh, just what do you just go back on some of the stuff that you've been talking about all evening with regards to the <coughs> Tories? Yes. And, and other bits and pieces. I do agree with you when it comes to Bodger Johnson. The best thing to do with him is leave him where he is. Because that will be the quickest way to get rid of him. Well, it yes, I mean, it does seem a bit bizarre that the left seemed determined to get rid of the person that might actually win them the next election, because it will keep in people's minds everything that the Conservatives have done up to this point. But if they manage to transform themselves and um, and reimagine themselves in the minds of the public, then they will forget everything that's happened, as, and, and they will be convinced that it's a new party, new people, new direction. But it won't be. No, I agree. Totally agree with you. Uh, it's a case of he's talking about bringing back... Um, Hanging. ...the right to buy. Oh. <laughs> I'm not being funny. We're in a situation where people are struggling to pay their, their rents and whatever. Mm -hmm. What do you want to keep doing? Do you want to keep selling off our social housing? Well, yes, they do. Uh, for the very good reason that people who own their homes are more likely to vote Conservative. But well, then we it's can true. end up in the other situation. If we all vote Labour, do we end up with the gob that is Rayner or the <laughs> spineless skeleton that is Starmer? Right. Well, I don't think it's, that either of those things are necessarily true. I don't think that Rayner is a, the gob. I think she says a lot of, um, of, of things that are worth saying. And um, I like her style. And as for spineless, he's quiet and unassuming and a bit wooden and boring. Which well, is maybe not what you want in a leader, but then uh, but maybe it's the opposite of... Uh, maybe, maybe opposites will attract the nation. Maybe we'll have had too much of a clown that we want somebody a bit boring for a while. <laughs> you know, somebody who doesn't uh, go around the country dressing up in other people's uniforms to uh, get photographs taken of him doing someone else's job, for instance. Well, this is the point about saying about um, do we do we go for the gob that is Rayner, or we go for the spineless that is Starmer, and we go for okay, right? We we've, we've done this, we've been there, we've done that. How are we going to do it from now on? Well, you you lost me at the at the been there and done that. I, uh, I I was following you for a little while there, but you lost me right at the end. Never mind, Mark. We'll drop pieces of bread behind us so we can make our way back again to where we were. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Hendon. Hello, John. Yeah, hi there. John. Hi. Yes, John. Yeah, um, I think the uh, the point the other caller was trying to make is, is because, maybe I'm just wrong here, I don't know, but I think the point he was trying to make was is because the government in France have capped the, uh, as you mentioned, at four percent. I think here in the UK they've risen by nearly fifty-four percent, and in France it's been capped at four percent. The the uh, rate of the fuel prices um, means, in effect, that the energy companies in France are earning less money. 
so as a profit, which means their windfall tax, in a way, doesn't really do anything to them because windfall means that they're making extra profit and they're not. That's the whole point. So, the, so the, they call it a windfall tax, but the, there's no actual windfall per se. Do you, do you see? And I, think, I think that's the point it's trying to make. But well, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, but 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 by that logic, well, that, by that by that logic, they're they're being charged twice. They're being told to take a hit and increase their prices by only four percent, and have a, a windfall tax on no top. Windfall, then, so the windfall tax is irrelevant. No, it's not because it's not irrelevant. Here's BP's profit per year over the last uh, well since two thousand and nine. Two thousand and nine, sixteen billion. In 2010, they uh, apparently lost three billion. So, <laughs> just over those two years, they're 13 billion up. In 2011, 25 billion. 2012, 11 billion. 2013, 23 billion. 2014, 3.7 billion. And then they lost uh, six mi uh, billion in 2015. I can't do the mental arithmetic, but they're way ahead. And then uh, they made 115 uh, million in 2016, 3.3 billion in 2017, 9.3 billion in 2018, 4 billion in 2019, and then they lost 20 billion last year, and they uh, in 2020, and then they made 7.5 billion in 2021. Uh, you do the uh, maths; it's absolutely off the scale, and the, the, that we are being invited to feel sympathy for them is just ridiculous. And this, uh, the, the government's insistence, Boris Johnson, when he was being uh, interviewed today by, uh, by uh, Susanna Reid, well, he was being <laughs> chewed up and spat out by Susanna Reid, he uh, has said that the, we can't enact a windfall tax because it would deter investment. Bernard Looney, B BP's chief executive, said a windfall tax would not affect the company's investment plans. Who are you going to believe? The man who actually runs the company? Or Boris Johnson? who has uh, famously declared that he is an honest person. Jason in Putney says, the profits arise after all costs, including research and development investment. Logically, increasing R&D investment might be rather a clever way to avoid paying a future windfall tax, so it would be good for investment and for the exchequer, just less good for the windfalls that shareholders would otherwise have got. Increasing R&D investment. Well, I'm sure they would uh, claim uh, tax credits for doing that but it's not going to affect their uh, their future plans one way or the other. I mean, they're not going to stop investing because to stop investing would mean to sacrifice future earnings. Uh, Swindon. Hello, Graham. Hi there. Graham. I, I've just been listening to you guys. Uh, or, you, know, um, and you know, my little violin's out playing for them. Um, I'm a mobile mechanic um, for a major UK company. Um, at the moment, on average, because of the workload that we have, because we don't have the guys in the industry, currently I'm doing 60 to 70 hours a week for the work to keep people's vehicles and, and equipment on the road. Right. Um, I can never see us going for a work from home. Chances are getting an 18 ton truck through the front door is never going to happen. No. So we're always working. Yeah, don't get me wrong, the money's excellent. You know, you're taking 60, 65,000 a year home, uh, you know, as you gross. Mm. But you're never going to reduce them hours down to four days a week. I mean, we are struggling to get people um, for the industry because there's just not the, there's just not the people coming through the industry anymore. Everyone wants to be a you know sit in an office and push a pen around. Happy days, but you, you know if you ain't got the stuff on the road to move the equipment, you're never going to get a business up and running. But what if you so, could get people? I mean, what what if you did actually have the the number of people that uh, would enable you to work four days a week? And but the the provisor would be that you'd take less money home. I I don't get me wrong. I would absolutely love to do a, a, you know my contracted hours, um, but unfortunately the equipment when you're I mean the company we got we got we got one hundred and seventy five thousand vehicles on the road. Um, and that ranges from gritters in the winter um, down to um, little Ford vans for the council and um, people hiring vehicles from airports and stuff. So we've got all them on the road. I guarantee you hire a vehicle, someone's going to bring it back broken. That's got to be fine. Someone with a skill set to fix it. Right. You've also got vehicles break down throughout wear and tear. The thing you just can't do it. Even if we if we had um, ten guys in my area 
they would have a full day every day, five days a week. We've got jobs that we have to farm out to garages, to we have to send back to dealerships. It, it costs the company loads and loads of money. And they're turning around to us and saying, well, look, do you fancy working Saturday? Well, actually, I'm already on 71 hours and it's Friday night. Hmm. You want me to work Saturday? I mean, we start at six in the morning. We finish at half eight, nine o'clock at night. It's It just would never work. Likewise, with the guys repairing the roads and stuff that we, you know, the kit we supply to, they're working, you know, you can't have them do a four day. We're going to leave this pot or we'll come back Monday. It just, it just wouldn't happen. No, I guess uh, having too much work is uh, a nice problem to have. It, 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 yeah, that's what I say. The money is excellent. Don't get me you know, wrong. I'm, I mean, I could, I get people ring me up on Indeed and they turn around and say, well, we can offer you this and this salary. But, it, you know, it's it's exactly the same job. It's just the, the, it's the overtime that pushes the hours up. Um, but it's having that network of vehicles to work on. So, yes, it's nice having it all there. Yes, we do get some quiet days. But predominantly the garage or the, the garages around the country we have or around the world that we have. And... The, the the work that we're doing, I mean, they've just given us all this new tablet system whereby we're booking in, we're now booking, purchasing parts and some equipment that we need to put on the vehicles. We've been booking the house. So we now become parts guys, administration. We're liaising with customers now, so we've now become customer support and, and front of house. And that, that work there isn't done during the day because you're, I mean, to give you an example, you go out to a truck and it needs a brake reline, you've got a day's work there. No problem at all. That's on top of the other little jobs you've got, like a service, inspection, six weekly inspections, uh, brake damages, car accidents, more and more car accidents now. So you get them out, you get as much as you can out of the way. Um, you then go and sit at home, and because they've given you a laptop and a, this program, you then sit at home watching TV and just finishing off your, right. your stock ordering and your stuff. Yeah. So you, you're never away from it. Yeah, it never stops. All right, thanks, Graham. Uh, that's uh, one of the... Uh disadvantages of being um, always connected, I guess. Bristol, hello, Jonathan. And the, the problem that your first guest, he started off saying that it's patriarchal, and I don't know what he means by this, because the main problem that we can't talk about with the little kid is, is that there's no fathers in the household, and you've got single mothers, and you've got an increasingly genocentric society where you, you have to say patriarchy, patriarchy. Why is there no daddies in the household? You can't talk about it. Well, that's the, there are the households that don't have uh, a, a male role model are the households that don't have a, rail, a male role model. Uh, that's the minority, surely. All of the psych psychological literature shows you that the, the same-sex parent is the strongest indicator and strongest role model in the household. And now you've got single motherhood. I mean, look, I've lived a lot. And before single motherhood was seen as being a, a tragedy, now it's seen as normal. And you go to all of the prison and you talk to all of the disadvantaged people in this country, and almost all of the men didn't have father at home because the mother at home really struggles to discipline the boys, to put fear into the boys, all of this. But in this country now, in this culture, you have to always say it's patriarchy, patriarchy, and women are good, men are bad. But you can't talk about the real street lives. Yeah, well, I'm sure that you know if the if it's a single parent, then they're at a disadvantage to start with. I mean, especially these days when both parents need to, uh, quite often both parents need to work just to get by. So they're at a disadvantage for a start financially and um, and for time as well because uh, you know traditionally the uh, well at least one parent, usually the woman, would stay home and take care of the kids, and the man would go out and earn their money. And uh, if the parent, if the if the sole parent has to be out earning, then the kids are on their own. So that's a second disadvantage. Greenford, hello, Paul. Hello, yeah, Nick. Yeah, I mean, look, big hitters: Boris Johnson involved, Liz Trust involved. But apparently, World War One was declared because Home Rule was announced. So this problem has been going for some time. But now Europe's got involved. It's it's, it's rather muddied it because there what was a mean? big vote. Wait, what do you mean? Now Europe's got involved. Well. The borders, right? The, the the EU border stops at Northern Ireland, so um, it's not um, Northern Ireland is not Europe. So surely they're going to do their own thing? No, no. Who is going to do their own thing? Northern Ireland. Or 
or are they? Or, 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 or is that the problem? They've got a vote on a United Island now. Boy, Sinn Fein's in power. Um, I'll I'll get back to you, Paul. <laughs> okay, no, thank you. Nottingham. Hello, Richard. Richard. Uh, good, evening. good evening, Nick. Yes, sir. How's LBC's bad boy tonight? I don't know. He's not here. <laughs> I've got. I've solved two problems for you. One. Go on, him. Um, Jane Oliver says we've got a children's obesity crisis. Yeah. Wokey O'Brien is always whinging on <laughs> that people can't afford to feed the kids. Just swap the kids over. Swap the kids over. Yeah, get the back kids, the ones that can't afford to feed them. Mm -hmm. They'll lose weight. Yeah. And you're the ones that can't afford to feed to the people that obviously can. Give the, the the fat kids to the people that can't afford food and they will lose yeah. weight. And give yeah. the thin, uh, the poor kids to the people that can afford the food and they'll get fat. Yeah, well, they'll get, put some weight on. Put a little bit of weight on. Wow, yeah. you, you've, you've solved society's <laughs> problems. Health minister now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, never mind about health minister. I think you can be prime minister. Can you start first oh, thing Monday morning? Much. First thing I'll, Monday I'll morning. Only if there's a party involved. Uh, only if, it, well, yeah, there's bound to be one coming along anytime soon. <laughs> Bring your dancing shoes, Richard. We'll You'll need them. Friend. All right. Thanks a lot, mate. Uh, Murray. Hello, Joe. Hello again, Nick. Um, uh, I, I, um, uh, I, I, well, it is definitely deliberate because um, that they always, they've been doing this for a long time, haven't they, the government? Um, but, but I was saying to your um, producer that I, I reckon Gove is behind this because it, remember it was Gove who announced that this is what people could do. Um, and I'm sure Priti Patel was, was, was not consulted and I'm sure she was thinking, well, hang on a minute, you know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, Pursuing the, uh, the, you know, the the we hate uh, migrants, immigrants um, <laughs> agenda, and she's, I think she's probably um, told him off and told him to sort it out um, and to make sure that uh, you know what is happening is, is happening that people aren't aren't getting visas. So I mean, we haven't seen him for a while, have we? Um, I. Yes, I can't recall the last time I saw him, but exactly. I, but then... I think I think uh, I think um, she's told him off, and uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> don't you think? I mean, well, it's an interesting you know, thought, and it's something that Gove would come up with um, because you said it's very clever, which yeah. it is, but it's also quite evil, which which goes with Pretty Patel, and I think she was, you know, it was like, well, you're spoiling my, um, um, my you know, my persona of. Right. Of being evil and uh, by, by by you know saying let's let's take them in. Right, that's that's a, a vivid uh, picture you paint there, Joe. Uh, difficult to know uh, the truth of it or not. Let's have a call in Greenford. Hello, Paul. Hello. Yeah. Yes. It's good. Um, what is? I think like um, you uh, talking about old bands, but like the writer Hunter S. Thompson was very political. He commented on the American. Um, stuff like and yeah. the, also um that geezer in groundhog day was part of his entourage you know so oh, bill but, murray yeah that's right yeah hunter s thompson fear and loathing in las vegas yeah what's and, he got to uh, do with it though um i think like going back to going back in the past like, i saw ken loach's um red and blue political docudrama what's that got to do uh, with hunter s thompson oh no or so, bill yeah, murray. Yeah, i was going back a bit but um it's like um well, you're just then, randomly picking names and uh, facts from uh, the past. Yeah, but Keir Starmer, they're making wow. him out to be... fast forward to the future. Keir Starmer, they're making him out to be bad because he's a depart um, um, d uh, public store. prosecutor. So. Oh, okay. Right. Well, you make a lot of good points. Thanks a lot, Paul. 0345 <laughs> Anybody have any idea what that call was about? No. Not one, not one idea. I bet he doesn't know what that call was about. What was that call about, Paul? I'm not sure. Not sure. <laughs> A rare moment of honesty on this show. Oh. Wow. So that's what it sounds like. Birmingham. Hello, Dave. Hello, Nick. How are you, mate? Good, thanks. Yeah. Um, you... You have been making me laugh for the last 20 minutes, right? I heard that 
today, right, if it, if the government are blocking people coming from Ukraine, then why, right, answer me this question, as Robert Genu, a uh, Genuick, is it? Uh, Conservative MP, Genric. yeah, that's the guy, right, got a Ukrainian family in his house. Why has he? Yeah, why? If if the government are stopping Ukrainian people coming over, do you know what the problem is? Go it's on. the Home Office. They haven't got a clue, mate. They couldn't run up in a brewery. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, but don't don't you think? I mean, you're talking about civil servants in the Home Office, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, but don't don't you think that they act uh, in accordance to their instructions from ministers? But but why would a Conservative MP, right, it, it, if what like you're saying, mm. or other people are saying, yeah, right, right, that the government is stopping people come, stopping Ukrainian people, people coming, coming in, then why does a government, in, why does a why does an MP, a Conservative MP, have uh, yeah, Ukraine? Yeah, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Well, it it does because you're just taking one. You're one. You're taking one example to make a generalisation. Just because one yeah. conservative MP <laughs> yeah. has has been kind enough to open his home does not does not mean to say that that's government policy. Yeah, but the guy's a it is a conservative MP. What? So why would the government want to stop it? Come on, it's... Why would the government uh, want to stop it? Well, well, don't, don't you think that the, uh, recent history has shown that being performatively cruel to foreigners has gone down rather well with the government's supporters? No. Really? Okay. I don't know. I was going to say, I don't know where you live, but I guess you live in Birmingham. I said that already. All right. Thanks, Dave. Hereford. Hello, Alex. Hi, Max. Alex. Yeah, so um, taking up on your point about cooking, mm. we deal with uh, we, we're, we're a, a, a food bank in Hereford um, oh, and a few others. Um, and who is, one of them, who is, who is we? Uh, the, what the organisation I work for, um, and and basically one of the coordinators at the food bank said that they found um, that they were having a lot of fresh produce and so on left over at the end of the days. Um, pretty much every day, and that now they're actually having to provide cooking lessons yeah. at the food bank to to teach people how to cook. Right, which uh, is what proper, this uh, meals. yeah, which is what this Lee Anderson bloke was uh, saying, and he got yeah, he yeah, got I mean, he got jumped on for saying it, uh, and it was um, I, I dispute his thirty p uh, the the part about the thirty p bit, but there is I mean if you don't know how to cook, then there is value in teaching people the basics. Well, having said that, though, every other blooming show on television is about cooking. I mean, Jamie Bloomin' Oliver has got 200 million quid in the bank because he teaches people how to cook simple things quickly. Well, that's it. The other thing as well, though, Nick, is that a lot of the time it's down to the equipment that they have available. I mean, I was talking to the, the chap who, who um, was telling me all this stuff, and he was saying that some of their clients that come to the food bank don't even have an oven, um, so they're, they're basically cooking through a microwave, um, you know, and they don't have the, the capacity to cook in their own... They have to say that some people are living like a one-bed, um, a one-room apartment sort right. of thing, um, where everything's all in one room. You've literally got your bed, your yes. sink, your microwave, and, and so forth. Yeah. So they're finding it extremely difficult. And what they're doing is they're actually also providing, uh, trying to provide people with these uh, sort of utilities... Uh, not utilities, sorry... Um, uh, you know, the sort of stuff to cook utensils, I should say, so mm. um, uh, to, to be able to help them cook. But on the flip side, and this is what made me chuckle, as a sort of a contrast to this, I know somebody who goes to university, and they they, they actually, in their, in their halls of residence there, um, they've got communal cooking areas, and she was saying that, that um, she had people coming up to her saying, do you know how to open this tin? <laughs> And she was like, "You just use a can opener. Well, what's a what's a can opener? I normally just have a ring pull." Yeah. Uh, and, this, and, uh, <laughs> and, and genuinely didn't even know how to open a tin of beans. Neck. Yeah. I mean, and those are that. That's the future generation of our. Of, you know, it wasn't. It, it was. You know, it's quite worrying to think that they go into uni, but they don't even know how to open a tin of beans. Well, that is alarming. 
but I'm quite sure that things haven't changed that much because when I was at uni, um, one of the uh, blokes in our flat, his dinner used to be eating mayonnaise straight out of the jar with a spoon. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> which, you'd, which you'd wash down with sherry, by the way, because you could get the maximum amount of alcohol for the minimum price with sherry. Mayonnaise wow. and sherry. It's an excellent way to start the day. And that is the official position of LBC. Thanks, Alex. Joe Armitage is the lead UK political analyst for the political consultancy company Global Council. He's also a former advisor on fuel policy for the government's Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And he joins me now. Hello, Joe. Hello, good evening. So this seems like um, a political open goal, really, doesn't it? Why is, is the government so reluctant to uh, enact a windfall charge on these energy giants? Well, I think they'll be looking at the picture in the round. Uh, and obviously over the last two years, the large oil and gas companies have, have hemorrhaged money. And actually in 2020 alone, uh, the five biggest Western oil and gas companies, companies like Total, BP, ExxonMobil, etc. They lost between them almost $100 billion. And so in terms of the profit we're seeing this year, they're getting up to where they were prior to the pandemic. And obviously they've got a, a bit of a bounce because of the extra demand for oil, uh, because of the uh, greater activity uh, following the, the release of lots of lockdowns across the globe. Uh, but ultimately, the profits that they're generating now are in line with the profits that they were generating in the years prior to the pandemic. Uh, and and that, sh that shouldn't necessarily uh, be an argument in favour of a, a windfall tax, given that they have incurred so much loss over the last two years. It's um, a little uh, something of an ask, though, to um, request the public to elicit uh, some sympathy for these uh, companies. They are uh, billion dollar organizations and I'm sure that over the uh, period of uh, the last five years or so they've done just fine. They appear to be, um, well, profiteering is uh, a word that comes to mind. Five billion dollars profit for just one company. I think Shell are about to announce uh, their results shortly, which will probably be a similar uh, amount. The, the, what you've just said, the, um, the temporary problems over the last year or so when the, the entire world was shut down, that doesn't really negate the, uh, the logic of uh, taking some of this money that seems to be unearned. Well, I think, I think obviously the, the companies in, involved would, would dispute the fact that it's unearned, uh, obviously that they are generating hundreds of billions of revenue and in terms of the actual percentage of profit that they're generating, it isn't a great amount in, in totality. And indeed, I think with respect to, to BP in particular, they've had to write down a huge amount in terms of losses in in their operations from Russia. So actually they, they have reported a loss uh, on, on a technical basis. Uh, and I imagine the other oil and gas companies will be reporting similar because they also uh, in large part have operations in, in Russia. But I think, I think, you know, the argument for extra taxation on these companies is strong and that's why they've always been subject to higher levels of corporation tax you know 40 percent they've been charged in terms of corporation tax which is which is actually almost double uh, the rate of corporation tax for every other business in in the uk so i think you know th there is an argument uh, to say that these companies should pay should pay more tax and in fact they already do well not really i mean the uh... well, it's double <laughs> that, that might be the headline figure, but that's not actually what happens. The, uh, the companies that are uh, busy um, taking oil out of the North Sea and have done so for decades yeah, they now... Yeah, they can get they, tax credits like they, every other company they invest. Well, they, they privatise the profits and, um, and uh, put the, the losses on society because we are tasked with funding, clearing up and decommissioning the oil rigs that they've made so much money from. So it is, again, a bit hard to elicit sympathy for companies that make so much money. And uh, it, it, it seems to be, well, the, the man in BP who runs BP himself said his company had been turned into a cash machine. 
Yeah, I think sometimes some of the CEOs in these sorts of situations, I remember uh, another executive singing to himself, you know, we're in the money in a, in a television. So, you know, they don't really help themselves when their companies report uh, profit. Um, we just seem to have lost him. Uh, is he back? All right. Yes, I hey, got disconnected. Uh, hello, Joe. Right. OK, so I'll ask you the question I was um, just uh, you know, uh, em embarking on. The government's position is that a windfall tax on these uh, energy companies would prevent them from actually investing in this country in the future. What's your position on that? Yeah, well, I think you know there are lots of regulatory requirements that are going to be placed on them over the coming years. You know, sustainability reporting, which means ultimately they receive less investment from the financial institutions that invest in them. Equally, you know, there's emissions trading that they have to engage in and they've got to, you know, on a, on a mandatory basis, move away from their investments in oil and gas and their assets in that arena. And so that's why they're, all, they're already investing in you know, renewable uh, technology. And so obviously they require capital to do that and they have to have profits to do that. But obviously, you know, there is a, there is a balance, there is a scale. You know, these companies have, as I say, been hemorrhaging money over the recent uh, period, uh, they're now back in profit. Uh, and you know, as a society, uh, as a government, uh, a measure has to be taken as to how much they ought to pay. You know, they already pay more than other sectors in the UK. You know, I know other countries have, have implemented uh, equivalents to windfall uh, taxes on, on these sorts of companies given the present circumstances. Uh, and, and there may well be an argument, particularly so, so there are 1.5 million people in the UK who are really acutely affected by the cost of oil for heating their homes because they don't have gas boilers, for example. They actually use oil to heat their homes and they are experiencing you know, oil prices that are four times the amount that they were paying last year. And so maybe, you know, for these 1.5 million households, there could be some sort of one-off scheme to help them. I don't think it would be particularly uh, expensive uh, because it is a very small portion of the UK's households. And it could be, you know, one-off given, as you say, you know, the relatively unique circumstances of the high oil prices from Ukraine crisis. But I think you know, it has to be taken in the round and it can't be forgotten that these companies, as I say, between them have lost 100 billion um, Dollars, which is which is you know, as, as I said, unprecedented, and so you can't forget the losses that they've experienced, uh, and and take you know this this relatively limited period of time, you know, a few months, as a BP in particular, it's actually lost money overall because of the operations it's had in in Russia and the effect from that. So I think you know in in the round, uh, it, 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 there is an argument maybe for the the houses that have been really punitively affected by the cost of oil because they heat their homes through oil. Uh, there may be a, a case for that. But I think, you know, with all these things, like with duty that people have to pay when they fill up their car, you know, it's 53p for duty, then you have 20% VAT on top. That means higher prices. And if you impose a tax on these companies, they're obviously operating in a capitalist model. They will then pass that on uh, to consumers. And 70% of people drive to work every day. So if we, want, if we want to have a policy that guarantees higher prices at the pump, I think a windfall tax would probably be, be the way to go. Wow. So, <laughs> so for the benefit of the public, we should not tax the energy giants. I think, I think that that is how the system works. You know, if you have a tax that is passed on, uh, the, the companies will not say that they're going to not pass on the tax. That, 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 that doesn't work. Well, uh, the uh, food uh, retailers have um, are competing. Yeah, with they're each... not subject to VAT. Well, they're competing with, but they're, well, they're subject to tax. They're competing with each other to reduce prices. I don't see that the same is true of the energy giants. Well, I mean, the the, the particular case of food in the UK is is not really hugely exposed to wholesale food prices. There are certain products like cereals, for example, that are. But with oil, you know, it really is exposed to geopolitics and wholesale oil prices uh, and so if the uk because pp you know all the companies in that sector are listed on on the FTSE, uh, and that means that they pay their corporate taxes in in the uk in, in many respects and so it is a possibility to tax them you know through a windfall tax 
But ultimately, if the UK goes down that road and taxes those companies in that way, you will see the Gulf regions and their uh, oil and gas companies benefit from the competitive advantage. So you're going to see the Western companies uh, affected by the higher taxes, uh, but the competitors they have in their you know, global industry uh, benefit as a result. So, I mean, these things, they're very complex systems. You then have to look at, you know, a lot of the companies that are in distress in the UK. You know, we've got five refineries. Some of them uh, would, would struggle as a result of, of uh, taxation in this industry because it has you know, supply chain effects further down the chain. So there are lots of different considerations that I imagine government will be looking at when assessing whether to have a windfall tax. And I think that in the round, you know, there may well be an argument for a very limited one-off tax, but I don't think that it would be something that would convince government officials very easily. Why are they doing it in France? Well, the, the, the French have a very different system. Uh, it's mainly nuclear power, so it's, it's quite small in comparison. Uh, and indeed, you know, the, the French are a little bit more uh, communitarian in, in their approach to, to government than the UK. Uh, so that's a policy that, you know, is amenable to them, suits their Yeah, but, the, but, but the French use oil just like we do. They fill their cars. Why, why is the French they, government they, they enacting a windfall lower, tax? They have quite substantially lower fuel duty on, on their cars, so the consumers but, but will But that's, that's irrelevant to the, to the oil giants. Well, it's not, because well, of course if, the UK it is. Had lower, if the UK had lower fuel duty and then you imposed, say, a higher corporation tax level, the overall profits of these large oil and gas companies in the UK... Uh, then the consumers wouldn't notice as much. If well, that's that's irrelevant. Never mind about the, whether the consumers notice. We're talking about whether the oil giants notice. So why can they do it in France and we can't do it well, here? Well, as I say, the makeup of a price of the product that people are purchasing. I'm not like talking about the price. I'm companies. not talking about the price. I'm talking about windfall tax on the energy giants. Why are they doing it in France and we can't do it here? Well, as I say, the price that people pay at the pump... I'm not talking about the price that they the, pay at the pump. Why are well, the they... Why are the, of, of course they're not. Why are the French... Why well, is the French government enacting a windfall tax on the energy giants? Well, as I say, it is connected to the price at the pump because, as I say, the French, they have lower fuel duty on the consumers buying at the pump. So it means that there's a greater degree of noticeability in terms of tax that's right. imposed uh, on uh, French you, you, oil. You keep, you, keep, you keep making a point that has no relevance to, to my question, but I've asked you three times and um, I'm not getting anywhere, but I appreciate it, Joe. Uh, spoken like a lobbyist, Joe Armitage, the lead UK political analyst for the political consultancy company Global Council. He is also a former advisor on fuel policy for the government's Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Farnham in Surrey. Hello, Jeff. Hi, Nick. Hi, hi, hi. Um, Nick, it's all about immigration, isn't it? Is it? It's all, it, yes, it's still? all about immigration. Brexit, yes, still. Brexit is about immigration. Um, everybody in the North still feels that uh, they've been overrun. <laughs> it's still all about immigration. London is three quarters immigrated anyway so that's why they did well i don't that's think it's three quarters well. i think it's about half but let's not quibble well, about fractions a eh? no no let's not so it, what's it, really it, bizarre is that the the places in which there are the least um, um, number of immigrants are the ones that are most opposed to immigration well i don't know those statistics nick i don't know where you got them from i just plucked them out of the air Jeff. good man Good man, excellent. That's, that's the best. Way that's to what do you it. do with statistics. You just make them up on the spot, <laughs> and then um, oh, you know do, lovely, do the lovely. little googly eye thing and uh, that practiced yeah, smirk, and then you're out. Exactly, but no, you you must get it in your head, Nick. It's about immigration. Right. Yeah. You keep saying that. I do, and and I mean it. And you you've got to accept <laughs> that because that's the difference between yeah. London and the. Well, yeah, but the difference between the London and the North is that London has got a lot of immigration, and weirdly, it, those that are surrounded by the most immigrants seem less concer least concerned about them. Well, I don't know where you get those figures from. I just made them up, Jeff. I, he hello? Are you listening? I made it up. But it's also true. 
These, uh, th these statistics and facts that I'm making up on the spot also have the benefit of being correct. Thanks a lot, Jeff. And when I say thanks a lot, I mean, you know. London immigration, 37% of the population were born outside the UK, including 24.5% born outside of Europe. There you are, you see. The bloke through the glass knows what he's talking about. Why aren't you doing this show? Crayford. Hello, Terry. Hello, Nick. Uh, okay. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? I, I can, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We're right out of time on that call. That is very sad when that happens. Very, very unfortunate. But, you know, the, the, this is a brief for three-hour show, and when your time's up, it's up. Fulham. Hello, Wendy. Oh, hello, Nick. Hello. Wendy. Um, yes. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I went to vote. Yes. Yesterday. Mm, but... Well, it was dark. Uh, yeah. And I, I studied. When it was uh, dark. It was in Wait a minute. Back up. It what, was dark. What, what? Yeah. Dark? Uh, in, in the dark. You went to vote no. in the dark? Yes. I Because it was, um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, it gets dark, doesn't it? You know, I mean... When? So, I thought, oh, what? In the sky, Nick. <laughs> no, not where. Uh, when? Well, what? Yesterday, when I was going to vote... Yes. It, it, uh, it was dark. It was dark. So, Are you sure you weren't yeah. just wearing sunglasses? <laughs> no, no, because... No, I, I studied... Um, you said that... You know those little cubby holes that you put your cross on, you know? No, you're supposed to put things. it on the paper, Wendy. Big mistake. <laughs> yes, Huge. But no, but, but, but I studied them, and yeah. they do look like, you know, a bit, um, sort of ramshackle, don't they? Yes, they do, yeah, they those, do those look, plywood I mean, um, yeah. constructions, yeah, they're, they are rubbish. Yeah. Oh, I because I studied them. You you weren't yeah. you weren't voting thought, for the furniture, Wendy. You're supposed to be putting a cross next to your preferred candidate. <laughs> yeah, well, I did that too. I can do two things at once, you know. Um, yes, and um, what was going to say? Oh, I, I don't. Well, I'm not. It's not defending, but um, Wales. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, Wales. Yeah, Wales. Um, oh, well, you you've got to go to Mumbles. I mean, I was born I've in been, Wales. I've been to the Mumbles. Oh well, you love it, don't you? Well, it was okay. I mean, let's not <laughs> let's not get uh, uh, you know out of well, control. Was... Mumbles were all right. Oh. It was okay on the on the peninsula there because yeah. uh, my sister still lives there. Mm. And uh, right, what? Oh, you've got to tell me what what was the uh, marks out of ten for the mumbles? Um, yeah. it was. Don't of... think about it too long. <laughs> Well, uh, it was a very long time ago, and all I can remember oh. was that they had uh, a fairground there, and um, every single person wore a nylon tracksuit, and I mean every single person. Oh, my person. goodness. Oh, it's not a good look. No. No, well, it's not, not a good look. On, not on no. some people, it's not, no. <laughs> no, uh, no. But it was okay. Oh, oh. I mean, you know, it wasn't great. Yeah. I'm not, yeah. like, running back no. there. Um, <laughs> I, I've been there. I've done that. I'll yeah. do something else no. next time. Well, yeah, go to Bracelet Bay and we'll meet you there. Okay. <laughs> right. I'll, 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 be the one, you, I'll be the one in the Kiss Me Quick hat, Wendy. Pucker up. Camden. Hello, Holly. Hi. Holly. Um, thank you. Um, I was just thinking about um, when I was um, a lot younger uh, and I used to travel on my parents' passport and oh, yeah. how simple as a child... Hmm. That that seem, seemed to be, and um, your producer pointed out to me that things might have changed since yeah. that happened. But I do, I, rem whatever. I remember that too. Yeah, but I was just thinking. I know this is slightly different, but you know, I was a not really. Dictate. I mean, ten, how, how much of a whatever. how much of a security how much of a security risk can a child present? I I wasn't, and I mean. Okay, I was going on holiday, and I appreciate the circumstances are different, but is is actually childhood that different? Well, exactly my point. Yeah, it, the circumstances um, aren't really that different because we're talking and, and about children. Why? Why 
wouldn't you do everything you could to keep a family unit together? Well, that's the question. It, Why? Especially if they were leaving a war their zone. husband, yeah. yeah, their husband, their father, right. whatever. Probably who, who, may, who, it, it, who may who they may never see again. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and then and I just think well, yeah, and it, it just made me think of those, the the passport days where I can remember mm. my mum, yeah. my dad handing over the passport, and you know, they just look at look Makes at them, look at me, me. the children, and yes. and wave us on. Right, of course, because what what kind of a threat to a country would a child or a newborn baby present? I mean, that's just staggering, isn't it? If it wasn't so awful, it would be funny. Jeremy Hunt used to be the health secretary. For six years, he was in charge of the NHS, and um, he is very disappointed with the NHS. He's got a new book, which is called Zero, Eliminating Unnecessary Deaths in a Post-Pandemic NHS. Um, he's saying... Um, one example of a, a murder around avoidable deaths within the service and a widespread fear about being open about problems, uh, and it would, if they were open about problems, it would damage public confidence in the NHS. He said failed managers were often recycled into new jobs where they continued to make the same mistakes. He is talking about the, go the government, isn't he? <laughs> he is perhaps uh, actually talking about the NHS, but it sounds a lot like the government to me. His book uh, reveals new details about his efforts to reform the NHS during uh, austerity and where he went wrong. He says, doctors and nurses are exhausted and the NHS as an institution is crying out for renewal. Well, that starts um, warning bells ringing in people's minds when a conservative uh, minister says things like that. Uh, well, he's not a minister anymore, but he's an MP. Was, was a minister. The government raised national insurance payments, uh, of course, in April by 1.25 percentage points to provide an extra 12 billion a year for the NHS and social care. So that it's not nothing. Uh, this will raise the health service budget from 124 billion to 163 billion by 2025. Um, and that 1.25 percentage points uptick in the national insurance payments is odd, of course, because as far as I can recall, the main promise of the government's levers was that we would get £350 million a week if we left the EU, which is £18.2 billion, not the £12 billion that they are raising by increasing our national insurance payments. £350 million a week is £18.2 billion a year. And, of course, they said that we were also uh, going to get no new taxes. Read my lips, he said. It's almost as though they can't be trusted. Jim texts, it's all a bit rich coming from Jeremy Hunt. He would be describing his own party's government, uh, where useless ministers are shuffled around and achieve nothing positive. And wasn't it on Jeremy Hunt's six-year watch at the Department of Health that the findings of the pandemic simulation exercise were completely ignored with necessary remedial measures not taken? Didn't he also enthusiastically front a government campaign against junior doctors, leading them to go on strike? I'm bored of this man trying to re reinvent himself. Yeah, he, he also um, cut the nurse's bursary, replaced it with an eight grand a year loan, making it uh, much harder for anyone to decide to become a nurse, and then has the nerve to complain about a lack of staff, as though the two aren't uh, necessarily connected. Chiswick, Richard. Good morning, or oh, it's not morning yet. It's, anyway, almost, good good. almost, almost. Good evening. First of all, I've got to say, well done, Alice. Hit the nail on the head. My mother was a uh, sister at Cherry Cross for, I don't know how long, worked in the NHS ever since she came over to this country. Um, both my aunts also worked as nurses in the NHS, one at Charing Cross, one at Brentford, one at Acton Hospital. But as they got close to retirement, the reason two of them took early retirement because of the culture of administrators and unions and wasted money where patients were, were thought less of. We were taken over by pill, pill my mum called them pill counters. And for someone who, as you rightly have just said, I earn in excess of 100 grand a year. I think my national insurance has recently gone up to roughly about 13,000 a year, which I have to pay within the first four months 
of each financial year like anybody else in that tax bracket would do. But I also, because that money is just flitted away, I also pay £12,000 a year for my family for BUPA, for private health care. Yeah. And I wouldn't, I think that the NHS is become, unfortunately, a precious white elephant. The code of silence, which Jeremy Hunt rightly does talk about, um, I mean, you couldn't get the truth out of them if you sent them all to Guantanamo Bay. It's a cover-up culture. It's also a union-based cover-up culture. There's, I mean, before the pandemic, the pandemic, COVID has become the biggest scapegoat for everything that goes wrong in the NHS. The lack of GPs. Before before COVID, the average, it was average of 28% of long-term sick staff. Long-term sick. Right, and that was across the year. What, so what's, what was, what, was, hang on a minute, what was 28%? Roughly long-term sick. People are off sick all the time in the NHS. Oh, staff. Staff, sickness, yeah. Right, right, right. You know, I wonder if this, um, this uh, cover-up culture, if, if such a thing does exist, um, is actually partly the fault of patients who are who've sort of been gripped by the american um litigious uh, culture of uh, suing at the drop of a hat so to protect themselves they try to not um, you know make make public their own mistakes for fear of having been for fear of being dragged to court and sued for a million pounds nick you made a you made a very valid point um you made a very valid point earlier on about um about the cover-up culture and about um, patients and about when dealing with large companies or large uh, bodies like the NHS, that you're actually acute, you're actually ended up being the victim yourself. They accuse you of either being aggressive or being this or be that, and it's 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 an ever decreasing circle of frustration on top of on top of the sickness. Alice made a very valid point earlier on that hospitals need to go back to being run by doctors, consultants, and chief executives that have medical background and understand patients, they understand making you better, and they understand how to run a department. My mum was a sister at casualty, and she ran the casualty department herself at night, and in the morning you'd have matrons, you'd have people that understood, that took over from her. Yeah. Now, matrons, now, they don't have matrons anymore, do they? And they don't, they don't have matrons, but you don't really have a consultant. You try and see a consultant, you'll see a hospital administrator. Mm. You have a board, a medical board, that sit there and make decisions about operations, about the running of the hospital. These have now been taken over by student graduates who run them like student unions, unfortunately. Well, <laughs> I'm not sure that's entirely true, but, um, but thanks for that, Richard. Merseyside. Hello, Chris. Hi, hi. I'm slightly off topic here a bit. Uh-oh. But, uh, well, that's not that bad. It's just that hopefully somebody can answer the question for me. Um, so BP, right, apparently they're making so much money they don't know what to do with it. Yeah. But they're only making that much money because gas and electricity prices have risen so high. Mm-hmm. So why don't they lower the price of what they're selling or like that to hopefully reduce the prices of gas and electricity? Does it work like that? Lower the prices so that they would make less profit... <laughs> Yeah, and then that way, surely the prices of gas electricity would go down. Fine. Yeah, but so would their profits. Well, if they're making so much money, they don't know what to do with. Mm-hmm. Now, I know they said they're going to reinvest, but... Oh, sure. Be honest, we've, been, we've been hearing about reinvesting nuclear energy for years and yeah, years yeah. now. Mm-hmm. No now, now we're going to get the South Koreans to build it for us, I think. We, we tried the Chinese, and they were like, hmm. And then we tried the French, and they were like, hmm. And uh, now I think we're, we're trying to get the South Korean. And if, if the South Koreans pass, then uh, maybe the uh, the North Koreans can do us a favour. The other thing as well is, of course, with um, wind farms, they even like with wind, we could only probably satisfy 27% of the country with uh, green energy anyway. We'd have to buy... Well, says who? Um, it's a fact, like... We, we, a the fact? Of electricity well, why we didn't you need... say that? Yeah, I mean... The amount of electricity we would need to power the whole country, mm. we couldn't do it with wind farms. Says who? I mean, when you see um, green electricity <laughs> advertised on... I used to work for Scottish Power, you see, so I know this. Um, 
because I asked them once, I said, you know, we've got 100% green electricity. We can't supply the whole country with 100% green electricity. And they said, oh, no, we, it's about 27%, but we buy it from Norway or somewhere. Yeah, it's 27% now, but if we increase the uh, amount of wind farms we've got, it would go up. What, in what capacity did you used to work for, um, who did you say it was? Uh, Scottish Power. Yeah. In what capacity did you work for Scottish Power? Uh, I was customer service, so... Used to oh, customer service. Oh, Aaron. right. Yeah, what, yeah. What's your complaint, madam? That kind of thing. No, it was... It, to be fair, right, I mean, it's, it's a hard job only because the way they advertise gas electricity, right? Like, say, for instance, all you see now is that the average bill is going to go up to £300 a year. Hmm. Um, and they say, right, we're going to... You know, your, your direct debt is going to be X amount of pounds. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people who think that you can have much gas electricity you want for that figure. Um, who said, who, who what, thinks you, that? Well, you'll be surprised, right? I'll tell you what. I am the surprised. Amount of, the amount of people, you know, we, they ring up and they say, you know, why are you putting my direct debits up? Um, we say, well, you're only paying £40 a month. And they say, well, yeah, yeah, I'm on a fixed rate. They say, yeah, the actual cost of gas electricity is fixed, but not your direct debit. The, the amount of people that thought they could have as much gas electricity as they wanted for £40 a month or £60 a month. So, well, know, as, uh, as somebody who does customer service, I, I'm not. I'm not sure that I. Um, I like your attitude. No, it's not an attitude. It's, <laughs> we had to educate. I say educate and explain to this. Look, I'll put it this way, right? If you go shopping, mm -hmm. you know roughly what you're going to spend, don't you? Yeah, but couple, 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 hundred, a hundred, deal, couple of hundred pound in a, in any supermarket of my choice. Okay, but what I'm saying is, is when you get to the till, you only know exactly what you owe them when they add it all up. Well, that's the same with gas and electricity. Nobody knows what they're going to use in the future. So you only ever pay for what you've used the previous three months. Yeah, I know that. But not everybody does, you see. Well, I find, that, I find that hard to believe. I also find it hard to believe that, that you are presenting yourself as an expert on energy when all you did was answer people's complaints on the phone. What do you know about it? Um, no, 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 we didn't. We didn't no, yeah, okay, you get it wrong. We, we don't just answer people's complaints. Um, people would ring up because, one, they want to change their tariffs, they want to make sure they're on the best tariffs. Right, and so I, re you know, I restate my case. What do you know about it? You know about as, uh, as, as much about energy as I do. You, you know wind power. I know a lot about wind. I know a lot about wind. If you just increase the number of uh, windmills, then the amount of energy that they produce will increase, of course. No, it, d it doesn't quite work like that. Either. Of course it does. Okay, what well, you'd have to do... Because as you know yourself, right, there's still going to be, um, even with wind power, you've got to have them spread out so far and you've got to have the wind as well. Now, when there's no wind, <laughs> this is why I drove to bought Scottish Power, because of the North Sea, they could put all their wind farms there. But you could have as many wind farms as you want around the coast, but it doesn't mean they're going to generate enough electricity. Because the, f the wind eventually will get less and less powerful as it goes past more windmills. Right, we just spread them out. Well, yeah, but I mean, how many do you think you need to go around the coast? To Six. How many? Six. Six. Is that close? No, nowhere near oh, it. Oh, right, okay. Uh, okay, well, um, as soon as you uh, meet an expert, uh, Chris, get them to call me straight away. It doesn't have to be just be wind, it can be uh, wave power. We've got no end of waves. There's nothing that anybody can do about waves. They will always be there. Uh, unless Vladimir Putin blows up the moon, there will always be waves. That's just a fact. Let's get on with it. Tooting. Oh, Valerie. Oh, hi, Nick. Valerie. <laughs> yeah, I'll be very quick. I know you have people. Nick, I used to be a nanny. Oh, yes. And um, honestly, I tell you, I love children. But? But the thing <laughs> is, I get angry because these people, some of them, mm. you know, the children, they have money and, and all this and that. I mean, I don't mind. I'm not, but the thing is, I get angry that other people have got to pay for them having babies and they have a choice. Wait a minute. Wait, they, back, back they up. Have ha, a wait, choice. wait, 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 wait. First of all, is the radio on in the background? Oh, yes. I've been waiting it. Oh, no. no. So Big sorry. mistake. <laughs> Huge. No, no, Siri, I'm sorry, Nick. Right. No, that's okay. So okay. you're saying that people have... Uh, who who has babies? Yeah. I used to be na a nanny, You used right? to be a nanny, and, and you love uh, children, uh, but... Mind you, in the first-time nanny, 
it was lovely because, you know, parents sort of like, uh, you know... Dreadful people. <laughs> uh, ...train yeah. the children. Mm. But, um, Feckless. Which, um, as I said, and the thing is, um, they had money. Who did? Um, they, the, the, par- the fathers had money to uh, stay there. They're never in. And what my anger is, I love to help people if they needed it, but these people are being paid... And it's so unnecessary. It could go to other people like now, you know? Wait, who, and, who, is, um, be, who is being paid? Sorry, I, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm not just coming over very cross. But, um, you know, um, a lot of people don't have a lot of money. No. And these people... Who? If they, who if are these they people? Want, well, you know, anybody, if they have a child, right, they should really be expected to pay for it. There are people who don't have children because they can't afford them. Right. So now we're getting to the nub of and it. They keep, and the government, um, they should really, they encourage this, um, you know, this uh, going on where what? people aren't responsible. I'm and not I sure that that's true. They, how does the government encourage it? Because they pay them for being off. Well, but that's not, that's not really... Well, uh, uh, I suppose that you could find an example of somebody who was encouraged to have a baby just to get extra benefits. I'm sure that it's possible for you to do no, that. No, 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 Nick. Oh, but, geez, Nick. I don't want to keep you long because there are other people. Other no, people. Nick, look, listen. I mm-hmm. love children. But? I, I don't have them. Now, seriously, they encourage them by keep paying money out. But as you say, there are people who want to get married and have a house. And it's unnecessary. I mean, the thing is, you can do something about it. I mean, I love children. But? But I won't... <laughs> I won't no, I do. And I won't have one right. because... You know, uh, because well, I, I, not I being won't. Able to... Yeah, I, I won't have one in the house because uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, no. with the mess and the noise. Ugh, no, the no, 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 Nick. No, yeah. if you had them, mm-hmm. you're responsible, not other people. And this this all comes out of people sometimes that haven't got the money to afford it. Right. They're encouraging them to but, have. But, but they're not actually encouraging them. They're taking care of them when they have babies if they're unable to take care of them themselves so, which is so, which is not so, the same as encouraging them to have children what that is is taking care of those least able to take care of themselves which is the mark of a civilized society so what would the option be to uh, allow the child and the parents to just die of hunger yet old I'm not talking about I mean, about that, that, that would actually teach them children. a lesson, but it would be their final yeah. lesson. Do you know, Nick, I'll tell you something. Please. Tell me something. You right, like children, okay. but... You'd, you'd fit in very well with the politicians. No, I wouldn't. There you, Nick. Well, I'm sorry, but I, you I'd, would. I'd take the money and the, uh, the, the, uh, the subsidised refreshments. Booze. But um, other than that... It's a no from me. And furthermore... No, 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 no. But I would like the money and the subsidised refreshments. Booze. I want to be very clear about that. Thanks a lot, Valerie. Forest Hill. Hello, Hugh. Hello, Nick. Hello there. Um, yes, I think the answer to the question you were posing a little while ago is the blue-green cells or grasses. Pardon? Hello? What? Yeah. Blue-green cells or grasses. They're not plants and they're not animals. Well, if... Okay. Um, well, uh, I am. <laughs> uh, uh, at least I know I am. Thanks, you for whatever that was. He was talking about something about grasses. Want to score some pot? No, that's okay. Manchester, Raymond. Hey, mate. Raymond. Nice to speak to you. Yes, Raymond. Yes, I listen to your show every night, mate. Uh, that's very nice of you. Thanks. Yeah, what happened was, um, I got, I've been scammed several times yet, but I was scammed. Have you heard of Play Store? Um, no. Do you know Play Store where you buy apps on your phone? Oh, yeah, right, mm-hmm. Yeah, well, what happens is when you get a mobile phone, you have to sign up to them and give them all your details, yeah, even though you don't buy anything. Do you? You know, just in case you want to buy something. 
Okay. So, I've bought the odd couple of things, you know, like, uh, instead of using the Google calendar, I've bought, uh, you know, another calendar. Right. I bought a couple of games, n- nothing more than, like, three quid. Right. And I, and I got scammed on there. It was a high to COVID. And I, I got about £800 within seconds taken out of my account, you know, for, like, game passes. Right. Yeah, Do you no, know what I mean? Game well, passes. Yeah, I, I, I don't actually play games, but... Um, do, you, do you know, like, PlayStation 4? Well, I don't. You can you can buy game passes that last for a year. Right. But yeah. the, yeah, you th- buy them th- cheaper. Right. I, th- I don't know anything about games, I'm afraid, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to leave that there, Raymond. Um, let's have uh, Belsize Park. Hello, Faisal. Hello, yes, hi. Nick. Faisal. I'm here to tell you something really profound. Yesterday, you kept asking the question, why is the moon so suspiciously perfect? Yes. Well, the answer is basically really profound, and thanks to you, I found the answer. Go on. Uh, Basically, it's due to the fractal nature of our universe. And a fractal is basically a, a massive image that if you take a small part of it and then look at a different small part of it, they look very different. But... If you work out the formula for one part of the image, you can make the whole image. Uh, and basically, that's that's why the moon is at that specific distance and at that specific size, because of the fractal nature of our universe. Even your own body is a fractal. It certainly like, is not. It definitely is. <laughs> Look at this, yeah? You have a head and four limbs. That's five appendages, right? Well... Each one of your appendages... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, think about it. Five, yeah, five, five appendages. Yeah, five, five appendages plus the head, plus my head. Yes. No, 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 no. You have one head and four limbs. Right. And on your hands, you have one thumb and four fingers. Yes, one of which I'm holding up at the moment. Without? Oh, you can put that down right away, Nick. With uh, and, and the thumb, without the thumb, which represents your head, your fingers are useless. So without your head, your limbs are useless. Well, they're well, useful for you, holding up. Tell, tell that up. Tell, tell that to um, a, a backbench Tory MP who wants to pick his nose while he's in the House of Commons. He doesn't need a thumb for that. No, the, the simple things don't need a brain and a head. Well, you certainly um, have uh, illuminated to science for us uh, there. It is an education, this show, eh? No. Not really. Anything else? Uh, yes. <laughs> Sadly, we run out of time on that call. We'll never know what that was going to be. That's a, that's a very great shame. I, I am disappointed. Damn it! Oh, well, never mind. When, you, when your time's up, your time's up. Thanks a lot, Faisal, for whatever that was. Fractals. Something about fractals. Which, um, <laughs> he understands about as well as I do. Right, this is the Members' Dining Room menu. Somebody emailed this uh, to me today. Probably uh, a great personal risk to themselves. Because if Pretty Patel finds out about this, off to Rwanda with you. Balsamic and thyme honey beetroot tartar. <laughs> it's a tartar. Bye bye. A balsamic and thyme honey beetroot tartar with golden cross goat's cheese mousse. Granny Smith apple and micro celery. <laughs> How small is that celery? It's it's so small it can barely be seen on the plate. Guess what? Well, as as is by the way the price four pound ten. What? Four pound ten for your balsamic and thyme honey beetroot tartar with golden cross goat's cheese mousse, Granny Smith apple and micro celery. Well, I'll go to the foot of our stairs. I am stunned. And of course, this doesn't get um, uh, delivered to you on, in a plastic dish with a foil top on it, like that nice lady I was just talking to, Diana in Surbiton. This gets uh, delivered to you by a liveried weight person in the grand magnificence of the House of Commons members' dining room. Can you imagine? Oh. Must be beautiful in there. <clears throat> I bet they're so drunk they're pinging off the walls. That was what it was like when I went there. It was just a perfectly ordinary Thursday evening, and I've never seen drunkenness, not, uh, drunkenness like it. Old geezers were, were li- literally bouncing off the walls. They were so uh, hammered. They were, they were, 
The amount of old geezers I saw being held up by floppy-haired Etonian-type youths was really bizarre. Highly suspicious to my eyes. Huh. Pan-seared mackerel with heritage tomato ceviche, elderflower gel, horseradish and charred cucumber. <laughs> I don't even know what half of this stuff is. £4.52. What? £4.52 for your pan-seared mackerel with heritage tomato ceviche, elderflower gel, horseradish and charred cucumber. What's, a, what's an elderflower gel, by the way? <coughs> Char-grilled ribeye steak with hand-cut chips, tomato mushroom, Bernays sauce. Now, for, to you and I, who can't afford it, if we went into a, a, a fabulous West End restaurant, that would be about £40. Char-grilled ribeye steak, hand-cut chips, tomato mushroom, Bernays sauce. To us that can't afford it, very expensive. To those that can, £9.19. What? £9.19p. <laughs> That's like living in the 1970s. What a life, eh? This is the members' dining room at the House of Commons. I am stunned. God, they, they live quite well, don't they? I mean, it's none of your rubbish. So, I, before I was giving you the, the starters, you know, just uh, sort of uh, any old uh, thing that the, that the chef threw together that day, like pressed duck leg and caper terrine with celeriac and mustard remoulade and sourdough toast. You know, just what he found in the fridge. £9.19. And that's the most expensive thing on the list. Even if you tried, you couldn't spend more than that. You'd have to have two main courses. Anyone you know uh, who's had two main courses, Bodge? Um. <laughs> yes. You believe this? Pan-fried salmon with courgette provencale, buttered cocotte potatoes, black olive crumb and a chive cream sauce. You know, just whatever they had lying around. <laughs> Pan-fried salmon with courgette provencale, buttered cocotte potatoes, black olive crumb, and a chive cream sauce. Seven pound thirty-three. What? <laughs> and of course, it doesn't cost that. We are paying for it. They don't just make this stuff up. It costs a certain amount, and we poor dopes who pay taxes pick up the bill. What mugs we are. I mean, really. I haven't got the actual wine list because they do like a bit of wine. Booze. And I know that from my personal experience when I was there that one night, a perfectly ordinary Thursday night, the House of Commons, and they were at, well, it was the House, House of Parliament because I, I was just wandering around. There was absolutely zero security there when I went. None at all. We just wander around. And I was looking uh, in search of the loo. And there's no, there was no signs that I could see. It was just wandering. And um, I followed my nose, which uh, picked up the scent of boiled cabbage. <laughs> and I, I ended up outside the Lord's dining room. Pah! You just follow, follow the sound of people going, Pah! <laughs> So much drunkenness, I am, I was stunned. I could not believe it. Bouncing off the walls, they were. Old geezers being held up by suspiciously young, floppy-haired youths. Truly bizarre. What on earth was going on there? It was like the last days of Pompeii. I mean, all of these prices are about a quarter of what they actually should be. Because us poor dopes that pay taxes are subsidising their vittles. You can believe that. £9.19. It is like living in the 1970s. Mini sirloin of beef, mini steak and kidney pudding, roasted baby carrots, savoy cabbage, potato terrine. I mean, the amount of... Ne never mind about the prices. The amount of effort that has gone into the, uh, each of these dishes. This is not some bloke out the back there who's just heating stuff up that's come in on a, on a lorry. This is this complicated stuff. They must have... Dozens of people in the kitchen producing this stuff. 
I mean, there'll be a guy that um, does the beef. There'll be a guy that does the pastry for the mini steak and kidney pudding. There'll be uh, a bloke that does the baby carrots. There'll be another one that does the potato terrine. There'll be a separate person who's on the um, fish and chips uh, stand. There'll be the, the, the pan-fried salmon uh, bloke. Or woman, sexist. And I haven't even got to the uh, desserts yet because <laughs> they'll have a pastry chef as well. Struth, the amount of money that it must cost. Very expensive to those that can't afford it. Giving it away to those that can. Leek and wild mushroom bread and butter pudding. With th This is not pudding, but this is, you know... Leek and wild, wild mushroom bread and butter pudding with char-grilled spring onions, roast celeriac puree and rosemary poached turnip. I mean, actually, this is the sort of thing that you would get in a Michelin-starred restaurant. At least that's the way it's, they're describing it. This ain't no rubbish you get down the pub, is it? Leek and wild mushroom bread and butter pudding with char-grilled spring onions, roast celeriac puree and rosemary poached turnip. I mean, for crying out loud, this is their works canteen. And for that lot, £7.33. £7.33. I haven't seen the wine list, but I imagine it is equally, preposterously cheap. And it's not cheap for no reason. I mean, if they've got all of those people that are making all this uh, fabulous uh, gear, then it will be a kitchen run along the lines of one of the grand hotels. I mean, they're, they're sitting in a dining room along the lines of those that are provided by the grand hotels. So let's assume that the, uh, the staff are numerous and liveried and excellent at their job. And none of that comes cheap, apart from to the people that are eating there. It's dirt cheap to them because us poor dopes who pay taxes are picking up the bill. It's just amazing. I bet it's illegal for me to actually read this, this out. <laughs> I, it's probably covered by the Official Secrets Act because they don't want you to know how high on the hog they are living off our money. <sighs> Roast cauliflower and tarragon steaklet with samphire and hazelnut pesto, pickled coal rabbi and uh, aubergine baba ganoush. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not like uh, sausage and chips, is it? Egg and beans. No, it's roasted cauliflower and tarragon steaklet with samphire and hazelnut pesto, pickled coal rabbi and aubergine baba ganoush, for crying out loud. £7.33. What? £7.33. <laughs> uh. I'm starving. How about you? Yeah, vegetables of the day. Side dishes now. Guess how much? One pound sixty-four. Now, I don't know about any of these uh, other things because these all sounded like uh, particularly fancy uh, dishes, the likes of which uh, you know ordinary people like me um, couldn't get. I go to um, Pizza Express when I save up enough for Tesco vouchers to get a free pizza. I do not go for pan-fried salmon with a courgette provencal, buttered cocotte potatoes, black olive crumb and a chive cream sauce. Because they don't do that. <laughs> but I do know how much... So, and, I, so, and because I don't have that kind of uh, food, I don't go to a Michelin-starred restaurant. I'm not Russian, so I don't do that kind of thing. So I don't know how much that costs, but I do know how much a side dish is in a fancy place. And it's about five or six pounds. To us poor dopes who pay taxes, but not to them. To them, £1.64. Because they ain't paying for it. We are. Would sir like pudding? <laughs> uh, they're all at the one price. All £2.71. Which is, um, like, that's decades old, that price. I mean, presumably these are fresh desserts. They weren't made in the 1970s and just put in the fridge. Gooseberry and hazelnut cake, moist hazelnut sponge, gooseberries and creme fraiche. This is complicated stuff. This is not a canteen. This is a fully-fledged Michelin-star type restaurant. 
this is a restaurant with ambition. It's trying to impress at prices which are trying to amaze. They must think we're such mugs. A fig cream cheese and orange mess. <laughs> Candied figs, whipped cheesecake, crisp meringue and fresh orange. I tell you what, if, if the Prime Minister was a pudding, which I believe he is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> He'd be a fig, cream cheese, and orange mess. A hey, bodge. Um. Yes. That is exactly who he is. And when the waiter comes around, just say, uh, uh, I'll have the Boris. Uh, and a port. Pah. You have to say it like that as well, otherwise they don't know what you're talking about. Elaine in Galway says, I'm trying to floss my teeth and you keep reading out that ludicrous menu with made up stuff and I keep laughing and the floss is getting stuck. I had Heinz soup de la jour avec petit pois followed by le nuts de cashew from Lidl. <laughs> that sounds adequate. <laughs> soup and peas with nuts. Well, it's food. It is food. That much is true. Let's go to uh, Washington, D.C. Talk to Simon Marks, who's on the other end of this line. Hello, Simon. Evening, Nick. Um, right, and m more mass shootings. It seems as though um, from this end that they don't happen very often, but they, they are pretty much a, a daily occurrence, aren't they? They are a daily occurrence uh, here in the United States, and uh, I mean, stop me when this becomes familiar. We've had now two over the last two days. We just heard uh, a little bit earlier this evening that President Biden is going to be traveling to Buffalo, New York, scene of yesterday's outrage, where uh, an 18-year-old gunman is now accused of uh, murdering 10 people uh, in a racially charged attack uh, against... Uh, shoppers in a supermarket in the city of Buffalo and as we were getting news that President Biden is heading to Buffalo on Tuesday came news of the shooting that has taken place tonight uh, at a church in Orange County in Southern California, the town of Laguna Woods. It's the Geneva Presbyterian Church. Uh, the uh, officials on the scene say one person is dead, four people are critically wounded uh, along with a fifth person with minor injuries. They have been uh, transported to hospital. Uh, this all took place at a Presbyterian church where Taiwanese pr parishioners uh, were gathering at the time for what apparently was a regular meeting uh, of uh, Taiwanese congregants at the church, which, like the shooting in Buffalo, is going to raise the question of whether this was in some fashion uh, racially motivated. We know that a suspect has been taken into custody and weaponry has been found at the scene uh, but certainly prosecutors in Buffalo insist that there are going to be federal hate crimes charges uh, brought against the teenage suspect there uh, and now we wait to see whether there was any kind of racial motivation uh, for the shooting that took place uh, in uh, Laguna Woods uh, a little bit earlier uh, tonight so a truly dreadful weekend that has once again revealed the total absence of any meaningful action uh, to stamp out this kind of violence. The attack in Buffalo uh, committed using an AR-15 assault rifle, which has become the weapon of choice. Uh, in these incidents of mass gun violence, we do not yet know uh, about the uh, weapon or weapons that were used in the California shooting earlier today. It's um, weird, isn't it, that the the Republicans and the right wing in America are the um, uh, are anti-abortion because you know they uh, they value life, but they are also pro teenagers being able to buy military assault weapons with which they can kill a lot of people. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm bound to say that with, with regard to New York, I mean, New York, as you know, is a solidly Democrat state, and it is a shock, I think, for people to discover today that handgun sales in New York are strenuously controlled, and yet this 18-year-old in upstate New York could walk into a supermarket and buy an AR-15 uh, assault rifle seemingly without any difficulty. So there are questions for politicians on both sides of the aisle, but there 
there is absolutely no doubt that the pro-gun lobby, uh, the National Rifle Association, not quite as powerful a body as it was uh, uh, three or four years ago because it's uh, had all sorts of uh, corruption scandals that have uh, diminished its power to some extent, but nonetheless it is a pillar of support uh, for Republicans seeking elected office all over the country. Uh, and as we discussed last week, I mean, there is this extraordinary uh, sort of um, contradiction between Republicans who insist that every life is sacred when it comes to abortion, uh, but Republicans who are unwilling to take meaningful action uh, to halt mass incidents of gun violence or indeed to halt the death penalty uh, in those parts of the United States where it is still in use. I see from National Public Radio that the Buffalo attack was the 198th mass shooting uh, in 2022 alone. So the one out in Laguna Woods is now uh, shoot mass shooting number 199. Uh, but I think what is the most shocking aspect of all of this uh, is to see this going on again and again and again and not to see a really vigorous ongoing public debate about gun control. I can tell you that uh, last month, not a mile from where I am sitting tonight, there's a, uh, a, a, a middle school uh, on Connecticut Avenue, five miles north of the White House, and there was a mass shooting incident there with a gunman who holed himself up in a uh, upper story apartment block overlooking the school as the kids were about to leave, uh, opened fire with one of the six long guns that police uh, found in his possession. No no one mercifully was killed. A number of people uh, were injured. I think the uh, the distance that he was he had placed himself uh, from the school was responsible for that sort of uh, turn of fate that no one was killed. Uh, and yet in Washington, D.C., there's no real conversation going on about how is it possible that that could happen in one of the uh, affluent northwest suburbs of the nation's capital five miles from the White House. Joe Biden didn't stop at the school, uh, you know, five miles from his front door, although now he's going to Buffalo. No meaningful effort whatsoever underway by either political party to address this issue. You know, when Trump was in power, the CIA and the FBI and all those uh, other security uh, service uh, acronyms were saying that the, the problem that America has with the terrorism is not uh, Muslim extremism, it's uh, white power nuts. And this kid who, uh, um, who got uh, mm. did this thing in uh, New York, he released a manifesto, uh, don't they always have a manifesto, in which he gave the excuse for what he is alleged to have done as, um, as an answer to uh, white people in America being deliberately outnumbered by the government so as to skew future elections in favour of Democrats. Yep. Yeah, this is so-called replacement theory, and it's been given substantial voice uh, by a number of figures on the right here, including uh, the Fox News presenter Tucker Carlson, one of the top-rated uh, nightly uh, program talk program hosts in the United States. Uh, the 18-year-old accused of the shooting in Buffalo uh, not only put out that manifesto, but like uh, the shooter here in Washington, D.C. a few weeks ago, live-streamed his attack so people could watch it, this time over uh, a video platform called Twitch. Uh, he uh, claimed that he had been inspired in part uh, by the gunman who attacked those two mosques in New Zealand uh, about three years ago uh, and absolutely espoused this concept of replacement theory that African Americans in the United States were uh, being given the opportunity to increase their influence deliberately as a result of government efforts to uh, make it much harder for white Americans to continue uh, being the dominant factor in American society. Uh, that's one of the reasons, of course, why they're going to pursue these federal hate crimes charges uh, against him. Uh, but it is uh, alarming the extent to which so many of these mass shooting incidents are now being uh, carried out by people who espouse uh, white supremacist uh, viewpoints. Uh, it does underscore the fact that domestic terrorism, uh, and, and you know, I suppose we were all first to learn
converted to domestic terrorism uh, and the Oklahoma City uh, bombings back in 1986 when the immediate response in the United States was to presume that it was some kind of a Middle Eastern attack and then it turned out to be a, a homegrown attack and in many ways that paved the way for all of these incidents that have followed uh, but it absolutely indicates that the you know it's not the enemy without that's the biggest problem in the United States today it's the enemy within amplified as they are uh, by their ability to talk to one another on dark elements of the internet internet like 4chan uh, and now openly uh, hearing about things like replacement theory another uh, conspiracy theory with no basis in fact whatsoever across some mainstream media outlets quite um let's talk about um, something else just briefly um ukraine and the republicans intransigence as regards sending um, money to uh you know to uh, equip the ukrainian fighters and to uh sort of help the, the the country what's what's odd is that the Repub republicans are rebelling over joe biden's 40 billion dollar assistance package but the leader of the Republicans, uh, Mitch, McDon uh, Mitch McConnell, is calling on Joe Biden to um, send more aid. What on earth is going on there? Yeah, well, you see, it's some Republicans who are bedeviling this particular issue as far as Joe Biden is concerned, particularly uh, Senator Rand Paul, that kind of uh, libertarian presence within the Republican Party up on Capitol Hill. But remember, in a 50-50 Senate, the people at the fringes, of course, have enormous power, as uh, the people on the fringes of the Democratic Party have within the US Senate. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why they weren't able last week week to codify abortion protections into federal law was because of a rogue Democrat, Joe Manchin of West Virginia, who comes from a conservative leaning state. In the case of Ukraine, Joe Biden actually only asked for $33 billion, I think was the original ask, $33.6 billion. And Republicans like Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader uh, up in the Senate, said, well, that's not enough money. We want to give you 40 billion. There needs to be more money in there for weaponry and humanitarian assistance and food aid. So sort of cent and I mean, it's, it's very difficult to describe Mitch McConnell as a centrist Republican without remembering that 15 years ago, he, you know, he it looked like he was to the right of Genghis Khan, <laughs> how little we knew at the time. Yeah. Um, but quote-unquote centrist Republicans like Mitch McConnell favour giving Joe Biden more money than he actually requested. Uh, and it was McConnell who was on Friday saying, I want to bring this to a vote today. We've got to get this money uh, voted. And then Rand Paul uh, threw a spanner in the works. And there are other voices in the Republican Party on Capitol Hill who are saying, well, hang on a second. Are we really going to send $40 billion in assistance to Ukraine at a time when the United States is suffering from a chronic shortage of baby formula. And this has become a real talking point for Republicans on the right because it resonates with uh, American uh, parents, particularly who are struggling in, through this baby formula shortage, which has been sparked by a, a product recall by the largest manufacturer of baby formula. The, the White House is accused of not having seen this coming rapidly enough. But that argument that, you know, we're more concerned with spending billions of dollars in Ukraine than we are in fixing domestic problems is becoming a bit of a rallying cry and that 40 billion dollars by the way uh, you know that that's as much as the united states uh, spent in afghanistan uh, in its final year uh, of uh, presence in the country and this is just another uh, 40 billion that joe biden is now going to get to spend in ukraine i mean my sense is they will eventually get it through but someone is going to have to stop rand paul from blocking it uh, he likes to be um, the fly in the ointment constantly on a whole variety of issues and you know to be fair to him he doesn't believe in American expansionist foreign policy it doesn't make any um, uh, he doesn't pretend to uh, I, I, but you know it's clearly delaying things and causing difficulties for Joe Biden and revealing divisions within the Republican Party good to talk to you Simon thanks very much for that cheers Nick Simon Marks, LBC's U.S. correspondent, joining us there from Washington, D.C.